the parrots. This is definitely the downstairs. This is the vast underbelly of the world's most famous store, a side that its customers never see. Storerooms packed to the rafters with a vast range of cheeses and butters. Harrods' own slogan to its customers is, enter a different world. Well, we're going to show you an even more different world. In Around London, tonight at 11.30. Billingsgate Fish Market. 5.30 a.m. The signal that porters can now start unloading the fish. Buyers can begin placing their orders. This man is the market's biggest buyer. His name, Jim Lovegrove. He spends over £3,000 a day here, but then his is no ordinary fish shop. On the other side of town, the world's most famous store gets switched on for yet another day. Nine o'clock, and Harrods is open for business. Harrods, Europe's biggest department store. Harrods, where they measure selling space in acres, not square feet. Harrods, record holder for the most cash taken in one day by a department store, five million pounds. You can bank with Harrods, insure with Harrods, and buy, sell, or rent your home through Harrods. Harrods exports Persian rugs to Persia, bread rolls to New York, refrigerators to Finland, and its pets all over the world. World leaders are seen holding its carrier bags on official trips. Millions of others use them to impress their neighbors. And last year, its sales topped 170 million pounds. I think you travel a long, long way to find something better. Oh, a very international store. Well, it's the ultimate, I think, at providing you have the money at the time to spend there. This brings the lot, so I'm here every day. And with Thames Television, we're doing a documentary Ooh, on Harrods. <laughs> Why you? do you come to Harrods? I've come here for 30 years to do my wholesale shopping. Harrods came up the hard way. Its beginnings were in Cable Street in the East End. There, in 1835, Henry Harrod and his wife Elizabeth, a pork butcher's daughter, set up a wholesale grocer's. By the time this film was taken in 1925, Harrods was already well established as London's largest department store. It had been gradually expanding on its present site since 1849. Today, the outside looks much the same. The inside is a different world. Harrods has 11 entrances. Once inside, the first-time visitor is strongly advised to stick to the trunk routes, which run east-west through the store. North-south crossings are only for the experienced. The visitor's first port of call is likely to be the food hall. Last year, it rang up sales of £17 million, 10% of the whole store's takings. 
By this time, the fruits of Mr Lovegrove's dawn raid on Billingsgate have been elegantly laid out. The real eye-opener is Mr Lovegrove's still life, composed from Billingsgate's more unusual offerings, and he's fashioned some fine masterpieces in his time. I should think the most vivid um, displays I can remember are, of course, the Prince of Wales feathers with the blue fish, red, white and blue. There was a cutout in the British Isles we did at one stage. And, um, of course, from time to time, my suppliers will get me at home on the phone and say, we've got a sturgeon, Jim, or we have a basking shark, which, in fact, we have had. And about three years ago, we had a 447-pound halibut, which was an enormous fish. But not even Harrods customers can afford an enormous amount of caviar. Indeed, at 160 pounds a pound, Harrods decided they couldn't afford to leave it lying around. So, while the ice and champagne are real, this caviar is lead shot. The food hall is 30,000 square feet of top people's supermarket. Every day it sells 2,000 rolls, 1,000 croissants, 800 loaves, with a run on pork pies of Chelsea are playing at home. There are 500 different kinds of cheeses, with a new one added every time the divisional manager comes back from a holiday abroad. The poultry section looks rather bare at the moment, but then it's only fully dressed in the shooting season. And the eggs don't just come from hens. There's quails at 120 a dozen, gulls at 60 pence each, and goose eggs, which they tell me are very nice boiled for 10 to 12 minutes, also 60 pence each. 9.30, time to put your feet up. The men's hairdressing department in Harrods is in the basement. It's been in the same place now for over 50 years. And in that time, they've cut some pretty high-class heads of hair. They still do, of course, but we can't mention any names. Cutting my hair this morning is Mr. Delahunty, who's been the manager here for six years now. Mr. Delahunty, why should people come to a grand store like Harrods to have their hair cut? Well, I think they come because we can offer a quick, convenient service here, and we cut the hair, I thought, I think very well. It's uh, a place where gentlemen can come and feel comfortable. We do hair colouring, a gentleman can come for a manicure. And one of the few salons left in London now that you can actually come and get a shave. A lot of the people here tend to be sort of middle-aged or elderly as opposed to the young. Is there any particular reason for that? Well, they come as young boys, first of all. Then perhaps we lose them in their late teens. But we seem to get them back when they're established, when they're in their late 20s. 20s or 30s. Why do you lose them in that sort of middle period? Oh, I think they go off to these trendy shops and they have this sort of thing done, but they realise that they can come here and get the sort of thing that established gentlemen require. What unique features of the department are there? Well, I think the most unique thing we have here is perhaps it's, it came from the housewife that would like to sweep all the dirt beneath the carpet. You can lift a little trap here and all of the hair will disappear away in a large vacuum. If the gents' hairdressing is decidedly down to earth, the ladies' has positively taken off. Harrods have just spent £600,000 turning the old-fashioned cubicles into what looks like the inside of a space capsule. They don't even call it a hairdresser's anymore, but a hair and beauty salon. So if you've got £47.50 and five hours to spare, you can get what's called a total look treatment. Massage, pedicure, manicure and hairdo. Ladies and wear furs, others wear shoes, boots, trams, customers wear, they wear ladies wearing ladies powder. Ladies powder, no, not that large. Thanks, Grandma, is it? No, what do you think this is, a concord? I don't. It's a concord. No. Joe Brown used to manage pubs, but he had other talents which suited him more for this job. He claims to have a voice like Jim Reeves and a poet's way with words. <laughs> Down here is the gateway to a maze of tunnels, running the length and breadth of the store. Down here also, directions are refreshingly simple. The wine cellar holds over a quarter of a million bottles. Follow the signs and you end up at huge cold storage rooms the size of living rooms, but at 30 degrees Fahrenheit, considerably colder. This is the food hall's vast underbelly. The storerooms turn over their stock of hams and cheeses each week. 
In the fortnight before Christmas, these storerooms work overtime to satisfy the food hall's voracious appetite. 50 tons of fresh beef, 36 tons of whole hams, 17 tons of fresh turkeys, and 11 tons of stilton, not to mention scores of lambs, pigs, and chickens. Harrods used to run a 24-hour telephone ordering service, but shopping habits changed. And 10 years ago, the two male telephonists were replaced by answering machines. Two, because a customer once used up a whole tape snoring, having gone to sleep giving her order. Orders are sent to the relevant department via the tube exchange room in the basement. It sounds a bit like Clapham Junction in the age of steam. 600 tubes hiss in and out of here every day along Harrods three miles of tubing. Once orders are made up, they're sent to the dispatch area by trolleys, skips and conveyor belt. In the dispatch ring, they handle anything up to 850 orders a week, sorting them into the various rounds for delivery anywhere within a 35-mile radius of London. Some of the names of the destinations read like an A to Z of a bygone era. Belgravia, as you'd expect, gets a daily delivery. Each day, every van makes one round with maybe 50 drops. Even though they don't stray outside a 35-mile radius, the vans together clock up a total of three quarters of a million miles a year. are based at Harrods Warehouse in Trevor Square, which is linked to the main store via a tunnel running for 75 yards all the way under the Brompton Road. Some of Harrods' transport has been left behind by the Times. The van in front was built in 1939. Its battery-operated has a top speed of 20 miles an hour and is still used for less urgent errands. Bringing up the rear is an American 1919 model with a top speed of 12 miles an hour. Rodney is Harrod's slowest but surest form of transport. He runs errands for the store's managers. He also delivers things for the royal family, including the Queen Mother's library books twice a week. The Queen Mother is one of a dwindling number of subscribers to this famous library, now decimated by TV and the paperback. It used to have over 30,000 subscribers. Now it's only got 2,500. Right, going on this time. Second floor, radio, television, studio, kitchen, wear, garden, wear, china, glass, thinly, shoes, blanket, books, carpets, paste, piano, dad, five, seven, two, three, four, 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 Going up. The pets department doesn't open till 10.30. Goldfish, guinea pigs and white Pekingese take longer to get up in the morning. Mind you, you couldn't have taken these liberties with the department's former inmates. In those days, the word cats had a different meaning, and Harrod's pet shop was more like a zoo. But quarantine laws and diseases put a stop to that. When manager Rita Stratter first came here 28 years ago, she never knew what she was going to be asked for next. The call came through at midnight for a foreign royal who wanted to present a baby elephant to, as he was then, Governor Reagan. And we got him his baby elephant. And there it was, trotting around there with its handler. And it's very beautifully crated up. Travel far better than I ever do on the tube in the morning. But it was crated off and went off to Governor Reagan. Rita has a host of other stories up her sleeve. One of her favourites is about a skunk. A customer came in and he wanted to buy this skunk. Beautiful basket, lovely white ribbon. And it was to be a gift. And it was all, you know, rather lovely. Would we get this sent down on a special day? It transpired that he bought the skunk, which he had sent, to his first wife on her remarriage. Once we won to Mr. Nichols. Uh, Two-way radios have been standard issue for senior staff since a bomb exploded in the house and garden tools department seven years ago. 131 is the call sign for Alec Craddock, Harrods chairman and managing director. 
Mr. Craddock has been a Harrods man for 28 years, but even he has to admit that things aren't quite what they used to be. Harrods has changed, as the world has changed. Of course, it's true that uh, we're not able to give all the services that we gave in the past. But uh, what we do try to do is make sure that our service generally is ahead of the field. And we think that's very, very important. Going up. Good evening, Father Hairstown in Banks, Russian Cashier, Sports Wear, Travel Next, Bobby Away, Living Estate Agents, Lady Men's Room, Marks and French Firm, and Joe Produce, and I, Bridget and Madison. Fourth floor. One o'clock. Time for lunch. Harrods has five restaurants and four bars, including its own pub, The Green Man. On the fourth floor is the Georgian restaurant, which seats 500, and Harrods claim is the largest waitress-served restaurant in the country. In the days of Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, they used to hold tea dances here. They still have tea and a pianist, but no dancing. You can get a three-course set lunch here for £8.50, including VAT. If you want something cheaper, or you're allergic to pianos, you can get a quiche, salad, gatto and coffee for about a third of that price in one of the self-service restaurants. Harrods serves 15,000 meals a day. Just above the Georgian restaurant, and still within earshot of the piano, is the staff's rooftop leisure area. They share it with air conditioning units, plumbers, painters, and carpenters' workshops. Harrods has 4,000 staff, rising to 6,000 at Christmas and sales times. Among their perks is a riverside country club at Barnes, with outdoor swimming pool, tennis courts, and cricket fields. They also get discounts of up to 35% on Harrods goods. 2.30, time for Harrods annual hat show. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our designer hat show. We begin by showing a selection of inexpensive hats from our London designers. Inexpensive in Harrods language means anything from £24 to £395. Harrods, of course, has a reputation for high fashion. This show is timed to coincide with the opening of the hat season. Even now, the royal enclosure at Ascot is awash with them. Then there's Goodwood, Henley and Wimbledon, not to mention royal garden parties, weddings and receptions. The cheaper the hat, of course, the more chance there is of bumping into someone with the same one. Last year's royal wedding gave hats a terrific lift, and people constantly come in asking for a lady die. No problem whatsoever. We can't get any modern equivalent, anything like as good. I have a lot of old machinery, as you've probably seen around the store, some going back to 1904. Vacuum pumps, just no modern equivalent replacements. We have our own power station. We produce a lot of electricity with diesel engines and turbines. We don't waste any energy at all in Harrods. As a byproduct, we use the waste heat from the gas engines in for steam, for cooking, for the tea boilers and coffee boilers. We pump our own water. We've got deep wells producing 100,000 gallons of water a day. Nothing's wasted in the place. Well outside Mr. Bullcock's domain and back on pavement level, a customer and her dog are taking advantage of a unique Harrods facility. At the bottom of door three, which incidentally is the one used by the royal family, are some kennels. This is as far as dogs get in Harrods. Having been checked in, they're left to twiddle their paws while their owners do their shopping. Yes, one of the men in charge here is Michael Quinn. Michael used to fit the filaments and electric light bulbs for 25 years. Then he discovered Harrods. Michael, is Charlie one of your regulars? Yes, and I've got lots of regulars as well. Uh, Bilbo here is one of my regulars, and 
Monty and Julie and Daisy. And uh, another one that comes regular is another Daisy. And then, of course, I got Digby every Thursday. They come from Kent, the lady who comes to hairdressing. And Digby is so used to coming here, it lets it off the leader, number three stairs and down runs in. Do they behave themselves when they're...? Yes, very much. They never do any, you know, naughty or anything. They're very well trained and, you know, I should imagine they're perfectly trained at home, you know. Very good. As you'd expect of cats that come Yes, hours. yes. I think so. They're very nice. 3.30. For the past half hour, a queue has been forming outside the Georgian restaurant. The queue is for the grand buffet tea. £2.95 and you can eat as many cakes as you like. The record for the most cakes eaten at one sitting, 32, was set by a member of one of the university boat crews. But you're the next group of supervisors that we've got coming off the executive training scheme and going into the store. And your job is going to be very much to maintain Harrod's standards. Harrod's slogan is enter a different world and you're the people. This is the Sandhurst of Harrods, where tomorrow's manager core is turned out. And so it only remains for me to say to you, as you go back into the store now as supervisors, very good luck with what is a very difficult job. Among those being given their final briefing is 22-year-old Sue Pryor. And that afternoon, she's already at her post in the wine department. During her training, Sue's worked in charcuterie, linen, modern furniture, girls' school uniforms, Calypso swimwear, and the credit office. Harrods Wine Department has kept pace with our growing national thirst. When it was moved here 11 years ago, it was given five times more space. Few people say no to an invitation to the daily wine tasting. I'd taste some what's good in. Oh, thank you. Yes, please. That's muscadet. That's a nice dry white from the Loire. The champagne fountain is a place to meet but not drink. The sparkle is provided by 50 gallons of aerated distilled water. The bottles are empty. The brandy is not as expensive as it looks. The decanter alone costs 200 pounds and some customers buy five bottles at a time. But next door you'll find the most expensive item in the store. This double row diamond and sapphire necklace could be yours for around quarter of a million pounds and the whole display for half a million. One of Harrod's most famous sites, the Green Men. Years ago, there used to be 10 of them. Now, there are only four. They can usually be spotted outside door five where chauffeurs make their deliveries, door seven, the favorite taxi drop, or door three, dogs and royalty. With that kind of clientele, the Green Men are not short of the odd tail or two when they meet in their basement robing room for their early morning spit and polish. What about that taxi that pulled up with me then on the front there? And you know, they all pull in. I opened the door and there was uh, nobody in there. So I said, I'm sorry, mate, I shut the door, see? So he looked at me, this old driver, and he says, uh, he looked around the back, he says, well, he says, a bloke got in there, he says, and uh, go over the house, he says, said Harrods. He says, that, uh, the bloke must have got out the other side. What well, in one side, inside the, the other. other. <laughs> and of course, it was an old taxi driver, you know, probably a bit deaf yeah. too. Yeah. Well, he says, I don't know, he says. Mr. Hudson's been a green man for 36 years. He remembers when butlers and housekeepers used to come into the banking hall to settle their accounts. In the afternoons, it was the nannies who'd come in for a natter, leaving Hudson to keep an eye on their charges. Today, customers are quite different from what they were years ago. They're, you've got to be prepared to have a go at them. Or, and another thing, they never say please and thank you. If you're talking to anybody, they come up to bash you and don't say excuse me, which I think is sad. Going down, going down, no or never, take his chance. Well, yet another day draws to a close at Harrods. Some 30,000 people will have been in and out of its doors. 1,500 pounds of bacon will have been sold, 1,000 croissants, 1,000 gulls eggs, 700 punnets of strawberries, 600 brown loaves, and 500 gallons of wine. Mr. Bullcock's machines will have pushed out 50,000 units of electricity, 100,000 gallons of water. His 60 lifts will have traveled 200 miles between them. In the pet department, Rita Strata, no doubt, will have received the odd order for an elephant or a giraffe. Outside number seven door, Mr. Hudson will have got another tale to tell his grandchildren. The 
telephone exchange will have received 10,000 incoming calls. 500 tubes would have hissed in and out of all the tube lines bearing personal memos. And that record of 32 cakes eaten at one sitting, well, that remains intact for another day. And at the end of it all, Harrods Tills will have rung up sales to the very pleasant tune of half a million pounds. And so, through a maze of underground passages, 4,000 staff come back to Earth, their different world over for another day. Your name, address, and number, and telephone number. Please speak after the tone. Oh,